Chapter One. Tom and his friends. Tom. Nobody answered. The old lady looked around the room. She could not see any little boys. She went to the door and looked into the garden. Tom. There was still no answer, but she heard a little noise. She turned around and saw Tom trying to escape. She grabbed his jacket. He had jam on his hands and face. I told you not to eat the jam. She was going to hit him. Look behind you, Auntie! Shouted Tom. The old lady turned around, and Tom ran away. Aunt Polly watched him go, and then she began to laugh. I don't like hitting him anyway, she said to herself. But I wish he would be a good boy. Tom's little brother Sid was a good boy. He always did what his auntie wanted. Tom and Sid went to live with their aunt Polly and cousin Mary when their mother died. Sid was such an honest boy that he sometimes got Tom into trouble by telling Aunt Polly what Tom did. Tom always punished Sid for that, but it didn't stop his little brother. A new boy came to live in Saint Petersburg, the little town where Tom lived. He was bigger than Tom, and he had new clothes. He even wore shoes. Tom only wore shoes on Sundays when he had to go to church. The new boy was called Alfred Temple. The first time Tom saw him, he fought with him. I can beat you, Tom said. No, you can't. I can. You can't. Can. Can't. Tom beat Alfred and made him cry. Alfred's mother called Tom a bad boy. The next day was Saturday. Tom liked Saturdays because there was no school. However, he did not like this Saturday. Aunt Polly said he had to paint the fence. He hated painting the fence. It was hard work. He wanted to play with his friends. Jim came along carrying a bucket. He had to get some water. Tom would rather get water than paint the fence. He offered Jim a marble if Jim would paint some of the fence. Jim agreed to paint while Tom got the water. But Aunt Polly saw and stopped them. Jim went to get water, and Tom painted. It was a very long fence. The next boy to come along was Ben. He was eating an apple, and Tom was hungry. Hello, Tom. Tom did not answer. He pretended to be busy painting. Hey, Tom, it's a nice day. I'm going to the river for a swim. It's too bad you have to work. This is not work, said Tom. It's fun. I like it. Really? Of course. You can go swimming every day. But you can't paint the fence every day. Ben thought about it. He watched Tom. He stopped eating his apple. He was interested. Let me try, Tom. Tom thought about it. Aunt Polly won't let anyone else do it. Jim wanted to paint, but she wouldn't let him. It has to be done just right. Come on, Tom. Let me try. I'll be careful. Tom shook his head. I'll give you my apple if you let me try. At last, Tom agreed. He sat down and ate the apple while Ben painted the fence. Other boys came along. They all wanted to do some painting. Billy Fisher gave Tom a kite. Johnny Miller gave him a dead rat and a piece of string. When the fence was all painted, Tom also had twelve marbles, a piece of blue glass, a key, a piece of chalk, a dog collar, a knife handle, and a kitten with one eye. The boys painted the fence three times, and Tom was rich. Tom told Aunt Polly that the fence was painted. She was surprised and happy, so she gave him an apple. Then he went to play with his best friend Joe Harper. They pretended to have a war, and Tom won. On the way home, he passed Jeff Thatcher's house and saw a new girl in the garden. He remembered that Jeff told him that his cousin was coming to live in Saint Petersburg. She was very pretty. And he immediately forgot all about the girl he liked last week, Amy Lawrence. He ran and jumped and turned in circles to show the new girl how clever he was. The girl pretended that she did not see him, but she threw a flower over the fence before she went into the house. Tom picked it up and put it in his jacket. He was very happy. That evening, Sid broke a cup, but Aunt Polly thought Tom did it. She hit him. I didn't break it. Sid did. Sid was so honest that he admitted it.
It doesn't matter, said Aunt Polly. I'm certain you've done lots of other bad things, Tom. Tom was angry with his aunt. He sat in a corner for a while. She would be sorry if I were dead, he thought. She would cry and ask me to forgive her, but it would be too late. He went outside and sat by the river. He looked at his flower. He wondered if the beautiful girl would be sad if he died. He went to her house and climbed over the fence. He lay down outside her window. It was cold. He might die, and she would find him in the morning. He liked thinking about how sad she would be. The window opened, and a servant threw out some water. She didn't see the little boy lying on the ground. Tom got very wet and went home. He was not very happy. Chapter 2 Tom Meets Becky Wash your face, Tom. Tom didn't want to wash his face. He took a bowl of water outside and pretended to wash his face. He emptied the water into the garden and came back in. He pretended to dry his face, but Mary saw him. Do it again, she said, and don't throw the water away this time. Tom didn't like Sundays. He had to wear shoes and go to Sunday school. He had to do homework, and it was boring. Mary tried to help him, but it was difficult. He wanted to do his homework because then he would get a blue ticket. If you had ten blue tickets, you could get a red one. If you had ten red tickets, you could get a yellow one. If you had ten yellow tickets, you could get a new book. Tom had lots of tickets. He wasn't very good at doing his homework, but he was good at trading. He gave Bill a piece of candy and a fish hook. Bill gave him a yellow ticket. He gave other boys some of the things he had from letting others paint the fence and got more tickets. Some were blue, some were red, and some were yellow. Finally, he had enough to get a new book. That Sunday, the new girl came to Sunday school for the first time. Her parents came too, and the children learned that her father was a very important judge. The girl's name was Becky Thatcher. The Sunday school teacher wanted to show Judge Thatcher that it was a good class. He asked if any of the boys or girls had enough tickets for a new book. Everybody was very surprised when Tom stood up. The Sunday school teacher was more surprised than anybody else. He counted the tickets. There were enough for a new book. He gave Tom the book, and Tom was allowed to sit with the important new people. Judge Thatcher said hello, but Tom could not speak. He was too nervous and thinking about Becky. What's your name? asked the judge. Tom got his voice back and told him. Then Judge Thatcher asked him an easy question from his homework. Tom did not know the answer. He guessed. He was wrong. He was so wrong that the whole class laughed at him. Tom hated Mondays even more than Sundays. He didn't have to wear shoes, but he did have to go to school for the whole day. Tom would like to be sick, then he wouldn't have to go to school. He lay in bed and pretended to be sick. Sid went to get Aunt Polly. Quick, Aunt Polly, Tom is dying! Aunt Polly ran into the room, but she could see that Tom was pretending. Get out of bed, you lazy boy, and get ready for school! It's my tooth, Aunt Polly. Look! It's loose. Aunt Polly looked. His tooth was loose. Get some string, she told Sid. Please, don't pull it out, Auntie. It doesn't hurt now, said Tom. But Aunt Polly wouldn't listen. She tied the piece of string around the tooth and pulled it out. Then Tom had to go to school. On the way to school, Tom met Huckleberry Finn. Every boy in St. Petersburg wanted to be Huckleberry Finn, and every mother hated him. He had no mother, and his father was always drunk. Huckleberry never had to wear shoes. He never had to go to school or to church. He never had to be home in time for dinner. He was always allowed to fight. He could go fishing whenever he wanted to. He slept outside in summer and in empty barrels when it rained. It seemed like a wonderful life. Hello, Huck. Hello, Tom. What have you got? A dead cat. Let's see it. They looked at the dead cat. I found it behind the empty barrels. What's it good for? It can cure warts. How? You go to a graveyard at midnight when a bad person has been buried. The devil will come to take the bad person away. You can't see the devil, but when you hear it, you throw the dead cat after it and say, 
My warts are dead, that's for sure. I don't want them anymore. It works every time. That sounds right, Huck. Have you tried it? I'm going to try it tonight. I think the devil will come for old Hoss Williams tonight. Can I come, Huck? Of course, if you're not afraid. I'll meow at your window tonight. Tom was late for school now, and he knew he would be punished. When he arrived, the teacher asked him why he was late. Tom was about to tell a lie to try and escape punishment, but then he saw Becky sitting in the room. Next to her was the only empty seat in the girls' part of the class. Tom knew that the teacher thought it was a punishment if he made the boys sit with the girls. I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. The teacher was very surprised. Why did Tom admit that? He made Tom sit with the girls. Tom sat next to Becky Thatcher. He was very happy. He tried to give Becky an apple. At first, she would not take it. He kept trying until she took it. Then he wrote, I love you, in his book and showed it to her. She hid his hand, but she looked pleased. The teacher saw it and made Tom sit with the boys again. He could not study very well that morning because he was too excited. Chapter 3 Tom Sees a Murder Everybody went home for lunch, but Tom and Becky only pretended to go home. They did not go home. They came back to the empty school. They talked to each other about things they liked and things they didn't like. They both liked sweets, and they both liked circuses, but Becky didn't like dead rats. Have you ever been engaged? asked Tom. I don't know. What's engaged? It's when you promise you love somebody and that you will never love anybody else. And then you kiss. Then one day you marry. Anybody can do it. They decided to get engaged. I like being engaged, Tom. It's good fun. Amy Lawrence and me. Tom realized that he had made a mistake. You've been engaged before. Becky began to cry. I don't love her now. Yes, you do. Becky would not speak to him. Tom tried to give her a brass door handle, but she would not take it. She threw it on the floor. Now Tom was angry. He walked out of the room and out of the school. After a while, Becky went out to find him. She wanted him to come back, but he did not come back that day. Tom ran out of town and into the forest. He went to a secret place and sat down. He thought about Jimmy Hodges, who died a few weeks ago. Life was so difficult. It seemed easier to be dead. You didn't have to think about girls then. What should he do about Becky? He would make her sorry. Perhaps he would go away and never come back. That would make her sorry. Perhaps he would become a soldier and come back a famous war hero. Perhaps he should be an Indian and hunt buffalo and come back a famous chief. Then he thought about being a pirate. That would be best of all. He had read some pirate stories. He knew that people were always afraid of pirates. He would become a very famous pirate, and everybody would know his name. Then when he came back, Becky would be sorry and would want to be his friend again. While he was thinking about this, he heard his friend, Joe Harper, coming into the hiding place. They played Robin Hood and tried to act out everything that they remembered from the book. That night, Tom tried to stay awake. He was waiting to go to the graveyard with Huckleberry Finn. He had to wait until Huckleberry meowed under the window. He fell asleep. Then he heard a very loud meow, and a neighbor shouted from a window. It was Huckleberry. Tom got out of bed and climbed out of the window. He found Huckleberry carrying his dead cat. They went quickly to the graveyard. It was about a mile away from town. It was a lonely place. They heard the wind in the trees. They waited for the devil to come get Hoss Williams. Then they heard a noise. They were very frightened. It was a voice. They saw a light. Then they saw three men. The boys thought they were devils. They were even more frightened than before. Then Huckleberry recognized the voice. It was old Muff Potter. Then Tom recognized another voice. It was Injun Joe. What are they doing? whispered Huckleberry. They saw the face of the third man. It was young Dr. Robinson. Muff Potter and Injun Joe had a wheelbarrow and some rope and spades. They began to open Hoss William's grave. They were stealing his body. Hurry up, ordered Dr. Robinson. They dug down and got Hoss's body out of the grave. They put it in the wheelbarrow. They told Dr. Robinson to give them more money. He wouldn't, and they began to fight. 
Dr. Robinson hit Muff Potter with a piece of wood, but Injun Joe took the knife that Muff had dropped and killed Dr. Robinson with it. The two boys were hiding behind a tree and saw it all. They stayed very quiet. They were afraid that Injun Joe might kill them, too. They saw Injun Joe looking at the two men on the ground, and then a cloud covered the moon. It was dark. The two boys ran away as quietly and quickly as they could. Injun Joe put the knife in Muff Potter's hand and waited. Muff woke up. You've killed him, said Injun Joe. Muff looked at the doctor. He looked at the blood. He saw his knife. He believed Injun Joe. I won't tell anybody, said Injun Joe. Muff Potter was very thankful that he had such a good friend. Chapter 4 Tom Becomes a Pirate The two boys ran so fast that they seemed to fly. They ran into an old building and shut the door. They decided they should say nothing about what they saw. If they told anybody about Injun Joe, he might come and kill them. Tom wrote on a piece of wood. Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer agree they will never talk about this. If they do, they hope to drop down dead. They cut their fingers and signed on the wood with their blood. Tom helped Huckleberry to write his name because Huckleberry couldn't write. Then they buried the wood near the door. When Tom got back to his room that night, Sid saw him but pretended to be asleep. Tom got into bed and fell asleep. The next morning, Aunt Polly was very sad. Sid had told her that Tom was out all night, and she cried. She did not hit Tom, and this made Tom feel very bad. He went to school, but he sat sadly in the classroom. At lunchtime, the news came to town that Dr. Robinson had been killed in the graveyard, and a knife had been found next to his body. It was Muff Potter's knife. Somebody remembered seeing Muff wash in the river that morning. This was unusual because Muff did not wash very often. Everybody went to the graveyard. They all thought Muff Potter had killed Dr. Robinson. He'll hang for this, they said. Then Muff came to the graveyard, too. He looked at the dead man. I didn't do it, he said. He began to cry. Then he saw Injun Joe was also there and lost hope. Tell them, Joe, it's no use. Tom and Huckleberry heard Injun Joe tell everybody that Muff had killed the doctor. They couldn't believe that he could tell such lies. Surely God would strike him dead. But God didn't strike him dead. Tom could not sleep very well for a week after this. He had bad dreams. You make a lot of strange noises when you sleep, said Sid. Muff Potter was put in jail and Tom sometimes went to see him and gave him some food or a drink. He felt very sorry for him but didn't know what to do. Then Tom had another problem. Becky was sick and stopped coming to school. What if she died? Tom didn't think about being a soldier or a pirate now. He even stopped playing his favorite games. Aunt Polly was worried. She thought Tom was sick. She gave him all kinds of medicines to cure him. Nothing worked. Then she found a new medicine. It was like fire in your stomach when you took it. Tom didn't like this medicine at all. He gave some to the cat. The cat didn't like this medicine either. It jumped up into the air. It meowed very loudly. It ran around and around the room. It knocked over a flower pot. It ran into the furniture. It meowed again. It stood up on its back legs. Aunt Polly came in just in time to see it jump through the window, knocking over some more flower pots as it went. Tom lay on the floor laughing. Aunt Polly decided Tom was better and didn't need to take the medicine again. Tom went to school and waited at the gate. He did this every morning. Would Becky come back today? Yes, there she was. Tom was so excited that he began showing off again. However, Becky took no notice of him. She was still angry with him. Some people are always showing off, she said to a friend. Tom felt very bad after Becky ignored him. He walked away from the school. He decided he could never go back. He was very sad and began to cry. Then he saw Joe Harper. Joe's mother was angry with him because he drank all the milk. Joe was sure that his mother did not want him anymore. The two boys walked along. They promised to be friends forever. Tom told Joe about his plan to be a pirate, and they decided to do it together. Jackson's Island was about three miles down the river from St. Petersburg. It was near the other side of the river, and nobody lived there. That would be their home. They found Huckleberry Finn, and he joined them. 
Each of them stole some food and got their fishing lines. At midnight, they got on a small raft and went to the island. They had a pan, some ham, and some other food. They pretended their raft was a pirate ship and Tom was the pirate captain. Two hours later, they were on the island. They made a fire and ate some of the ham. They talked about being pirates and decided they did not want to steal anything or hurt anybody, but they would still be pirates. Then they fell asleep. Chapter 5 Tom and His Friends Die When Tom woke up in the morning, he wondered where he was. He sat up and then he remembered. They were pirates on Jackson's Island. He woke Huckleberry and Joe, and soon they were swimming in the shallow water of a sandbar. They were not homesick at all. The raft had drifted away during the night, but they were not worried. They couldn't swim to St. Petersburg because the river on that side was very wide. But they could swim to the other side of the river. It was not far. There, they could take the ferry to St. Petersburg if they wanted to. They caught some fish and cooked them for breakfast. It was the nicest fish they had ever eaten. They explored the island. It was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. It was only 200 yards from the other side of the river. They returned to the fire and had some ham for lunch. They were tired and laid down to rest. They were beginning to feel a little homesick, but none of them told the others. Then they heard a noise coming from the river. They saw the ferry boat near St. Petersburg. They heard guns being fired. What are they doing? asked Joe. I know, said Tom. Somebody has drowned. That's what they do when somebody drowns. Makes the body come up. I wish I were there, said Huckleberry. I wonder who it is. Suddenly, Tom thought of something. I know who it is. It's us. This made them all very happy. They could imagine everybody crying for them. People would be remembering all the good things about them. It was a good thing to be a pirate after all. They watched until the ferry went back to St. Petersburg. Then they caught some more fish and had dinner. They sat by the fire as it grew dark. Joe did not like the darkness. He began to wonder if they should go back to St. Petersburg. He told Tom, but Tom laughed at him. Huckleberry fell asleep first, and then Joe. Tom, however, looked for some pieces of bark and wrote on them. He put one of them in his pocket and the other in Huckleberry's hat. Then he swam to the other side of the river and ran to the ferry. Nobody saw him sneak into the lifeboat and hide there. After a while, the ferry crossed the river to St. Petersburg. Tom waited until everybody had gone. Then he got out and ran to his house. Nobody saw him sneak into the house. Nobody saw him go under Aunt Polly's bed. Aunt Polly came in with Joe Harper's mother, but they did not know he was under the bed. Tom listened to them talking about him and Joe. Sid and Mary were there, too. They were all very sad and said lots of nice things about Tom and Joe. Everybody believed they had drowned because the small raft was gone and then found on the other side of the river. Then Tom heard them talk about the funeral, which would be on Sunday. Mrs. Harper left, and Aunt Polly went to bed. Tom waited until she was asleep. Then he got out of his hiding place. He put the piece of bark near the candle. Then he kissed his aunt. He thought about the bark and decided to put it back into his pocket. Nobody saw him as he went back to the river. Nobody saw him take a small boat and row back to the other side. It was already light when he got back to the island and the other pirates. He told them about his adventure, and they had a very happy breakfast. Tom slept most of the morning. In the afternoon, they swam and fished and played games. The day seemed to be very long. Let's go home, boys. It's too lonely here, suggested Joe. But it's very good for swimming and fishing here, said Tom. I don't care. I want to go home. You're just a baby. I'll never speak to you again, shouted Joe. He began to walk to the sandbar. Huckleberry and Tom watched him. I want to go too, said Huckleberry. I'm going to stay here, answered Tom. Come back with us, Tom. You'll be all alone. Huckleberry began to follow Joe. Wait, I want to tell you something, shouted Tom. He went to them and told them his secret plan. They all agreed with it and decided to stay. Everybody was happy again. That night there was a terrible storm and the boys were afraid. Everything got very wet. In the morning they made a new fire. They dried their clothes and cooked a hot breakfast. 
they decided to stop being pirates for a while. They became Indians instead and played happily all day. Chapter 6 Tom is Alive Again It was Saturday afternoon, and nobody was happy in St. Petersburg. Sunday was the day of the funeral. Becky was crying near the school. Other children were talking about Tom and Joe and Huckleberry. They talked sadly about what they did and said. It was a sad, sad day. On Sunday morning, the church was full of people. The minister talked about the three boys. Many people cried with Aunt Polly and Mrs. Harper. Even the minister cried as he talked. Then the church door opened and the three boys walked in. They had been hiding in the church, listening to their own funeral. Everybody hugged and kissed them. The sad church became the happiest church that anybody had ever seen. That was the plan Tom told his two friends when they wanted to go home. They all loved the idea of attending their own funeral. When Tom got home, Aunt Polly was a little angry with him. It was a mean trick, she said. You should have told me so that I would not cry. Then Tom told her, Marion said about his visit to the house when he hid under the bed and listened to Aunt Polly and Mrs. Harper. But he told them it was a dream. They were surprised that his dream was exactly what had happened. Then he told them about the piece of bark that said they were not dead and how he kissed Aunt Polly at the end of the dream. The next day at school, Tom was famous. He walked around like an important person. He ignored Becky. He didn't need her now. She was annoyed. She invited the other children to a picnic, but she did not invite Tom. Tom went to talk to Amy Lawrence. Becky saw this and started to talk to Alfred Temple, the new boy that Tom had fought with. Tom saw this, and he felt very strange. He forgot to listen to Amy Lawrence. Tom went home at lunchtime, but he did not come back that afternoon. Alfred Temple wanted to talk to Becky again, but she told him to go away. I hate you, she yelled. Poor Alfred wondered what he had done. He was angry, and Becky saw him tear Tom's spelling book. She wanted to tell Tom, but then she changed her mind. Let him suffer. When Tom got home, Aunt Polly was angry. Joe Harper had told his mother about Tom's visit to Aunt Polly's house while they were on the island, and Mrs. Harper had told Aunt Polly. Aunt Polly knew that Tom was lying about the dream. You just came here that night to laugh at me. No, I didn't. I really wanted to tell you that we were not dead. I wrote it on some bark, but when you talked about the funeral, I had a good idea. So I put the bark back in my pocket, then I kissed you and left. Aunt Polly wanted to believe him. She looked in his jacket for the piece of bark. She found it, and she was very happy. She forgave Tom. Becky knew Tom would get into trouble for tearing his spelling book. She knew Tom did not do it, but she did not care. She wanted Tom to suffer. When she went inside the classroom, she saw the teacher's favorite book on his desk. Mr. Dobbins would never allow anybody to touch this book. There was nobody in the room, so Becky picked it up and looked at it. Just then, Tom came into the room. Becky was surprised. She dropped the book and tore one of the pages. Tom saw it. Becky was very frightened because she knew Mr. Dobbins would be angry and punish her. She had never been punished before. Tom was not afraid of being punished. He had been punished many times. He thought it was good that Becky should be punished too. Tom didn't know that Alfred Temple had torn his spelling book. He thought he might have done it himself. Mr. Dobbins punished him for it. Then Mr. Dobbins found the torn page in his favorite book. Who did this? He shouted. Nobody answered. Tom looked at Becky and saw that she was almost crying because she was so scared. He called out to Mr. Dobbins. I did it. Mr. Dobbins was not surprised that Tom had torn the book. However, he was surprised that Tom admitted it. He punished Tom for this, too. It was a heavy punishment. After school, Becky told Tom that Alfred Temple had torn his book and thanked him for taking her punishment. Tom was very happy. At last, Becky was his friend again. Chapter 7 Tom Helps Muff Potter The long holiday started after school was finished for the year. Tom and his friends spent a lot of time playing near the river. A band visited St. Petersburg. For the next few days, Tom and Joe pretended to be in a band. 
and when a circus visited St. Petersburg for the next few days, Tom and Joe pretended to be in a circus. Becky had gone out of town for the holiday. Tom soon got bored. Then he got the measles. He was very sick for two weeks. After that, he was better for a few days. Then he got sick again and had to stay in bed for three weeks. After some more time had passed, it was time for the trial of Muff Potter for the murder of Dr. Robinson in the graveyard. Tom found Huckleberry Finn. Huck, have you told anyone what we saw? Of course not. I feel sorry for Muff sometimes. He didn't kill him, but I think they will hang him. I do too, Tom. He never hurts anybody, and he taught me how to fish. He fixed my kite once. Maybe we could help him escape. They'd only catch him again. That's true. They went to the jail and brought Muff Potter some tobacco and matches. Thanks, boys. You have been very kind to me. Nobody else is kind to me. Let me shake your hands. They're only little hands, but they helped me a lot. Tom went home feeling very bad. He stayed near the courthouse for the next few days. Injun Joe told his story again. Everybody believed it. They all thought that Muff Potter would be hanged. Even his lawyer looked sad. That night, Tom felt worse than ever. He went to see Muff's lawyer. The next day, the witnesses told their stories. Then Muff's lawyer spoke. Call Tom Sawyer. Everybody was surprised. Tom came into the court. He told the judge what he and Huckleberry had seen. Injun Joe was frightened when he heard this. He jumped out of the window of the courthouse and ran away. Now Tom was really famous. His name was in the newspaper. He enjoyed being famous, but at nighttime he was very frightened. Everybody looked for Injun Joe, but nobody could find him. Tom dreamed about him every night. The days slowly passed by. Tom's fearful dream of Injun Joe was replaced by another, more pleasant dream. He and Huckleberry decided to dig for buried treasure. Tom had read about it in a book. It's always under a tree with a dead branch, he explained. Who puts it there? Robbers, of course. If it were mine, I'd spend it. Why do they bury it? It's just what robbers do. Don't they come back and get it? No, they always forget or they die. There was a big tree with a dead branch about three miles away from St. Petersburg. The boys got some tools and went there. They dug a hole, but they didn't find any treasure. They dug another hole, but they still didn't find any treasure. Then Tom remembered. I know what's wrong. You can only find the right place if you look at where the shadow falls at midnight. They hid their tools in the bushes and then came back that night. They didn't like being outside at night because they were afraid of Injun Joe. They dug another hole, but they still didn't find any treasure. Let's try somewhere else, suggested Huck. We could try the haunted house. We could dig there in the daytime, because ghosts only come during the night. They walked past the haunted house on their way home. It looked very frightening in the moonlight. The next day was Friday. They didn't go to the haunted house because it was believed that people always had bad luck on Fridays. They played Robin Hood instead. On Saturday, they went back to the tree to get their tools. They dug another hole but they still didn't find any treasure. Then they went to the haunted house. The house was very old. Everything was broken. There was no floor and grass grew inside the house. They went in quietly and began to look around. After a while, they were less frightened. They put their tools in a corner and went up the stairs to see what was there. They heard a noise. They lay down and looked through a hole in the floor. Two men came into the house. One of them was a stranger. The other was the deaf and dumb Spanish man who had arrived in St. Petersburg a few weeks ago. Then the boys got a surprise. The deaf and dumb Spaniard spoke. They recognized his voice. It was Injun Joe. Chapter 8 Tom and the Treasure Tom and Huck were very frightened. Through the hole in the floor, they saw the two men eat some food and talk. Injun Joe said that he would get back into St. Petersburg. The men were tired and fell asleep. However, the boys did not dare to go downstairs in case the men heard them. They lay upstairs for a very long time. Finally, the two men woke up. They then lifted up a stone in the ground and took out some money they had stolen. The stranger said there was over $600 there. Injun Joe lifted up another stone and found a box. What's this? he asked. 
They pulled the box out of the ground and opened it. The boys could see there was money in it. They were very excited. There's thousands of dollars in here, said the stranger. It must have been left here by Merle and his gang. They used to hide here, said Injun Joe. What will we do with it? We'll take it to my hideout. Number one or number two? Number two, under the cross. Then after I take my revenge, we'll go to Texas. Then they saw the boys' tools in the corner. Injun Joe decided to look upstairs. The boys were very frightened, but they got lucky. The stairs broke when Injun Joe stood on them. The two men left the house and went toward the river. It was dark. Tom and Huckleberry were worried that Injun Joe wanted to take revenge against them. Tom went home as quickly as he could. The next day, Tom and Huckleberry talked about what had happened. They wanted to get the money hidden by Injun Joe and his friend. But where was it? They remembered Injun Joe had said number two. They thought this must be the number of the room in the hotel where the deaf and dumb Spaniard, who was really Injun Joe, was staying. They decided to try and get into his room and take the money. The room had a door that led to the street behind the hotel. The boys got all the keys they could find anywhere, and Tom tried to open the door. None of the keys worked. Then he discovered the door was not locked. He opened it. He saw Injun Joe asleep on the floor and ran away as fast as he could. Did you see the box of money? asked Huckleberry. I didn't look for it. I saw Injun Joe when I ran. They made a new plan. Huckleberry would watch the door every night. If he saw Injun Joe go out, he would get Tom, and they would look in the room for the box of money. On Friday morning, Becky Thatcher came back to St. Petersburg. Tom was very pleased. Becky's long-delayed picnic was finally on Saturday, and Mrs. Thatcher said Becky could sleep over at Susie Harper's house after the picnic. All the children in St. Petersburg got on the boat and went three miles down the river for the picnic. They played games until they were hot, and then they ate and drank. After that, they all went up to the caves with some candles. The caves were very big. Nobody knew how big they were, but Tom knew a lot about the caves because he often played there. There were lots of tunnels, and the children liked playing in them. After a while, they left the caves and went back to St. Petersburg on the boat. The night came. Huckleberry was still watching the door of number two. He heard the door open, and two men came out. One of them was carrying a box. He should have called Tom, but Huck decided to follow the men instead. They went into the forest and toward the house where Widow Douglas lived. Huckleberry heard Injun Joe explain that he wanted revenge on the widow because he hated her dead husband. He told his friend that he was not going to kill her. He just wanted to hurt her. His friend did not like it. He wanted to leave. Injun Joe would not leave. There was a light in the window of the widow's house, and the two men decided to wait until she went to bed. Huckleberry ran off to the nearest house, where the Welshman lived with his two grown sons. He told them about the men who wanted to hurt Widow Douglas, but he didn't tell them it was Injun Joe. The Welshman and his sons went into the forest. Huckleberry followed them. When he heard the men shouting, he ran away as fast as his legs could carry him. Early in the morning, he went back to the Welshman's house. The Welshman had chased the two men, but they escaped. Huckleberry told them that one of the men was the deaf and dumb Spaniard. The Welshman sent his sons to tell the sheriff. Then Huckleberry told him what the deaf and dumb Spaniard had said about the widow. How could a deaf and dumb man say that? Huckleberry realized he had made a mistake. He had to tell the Welshman that it was really Injun Joe. Please don't tell anybody that I told you, he said. Widow Douglas and some friends came to thank the Welshman for chasing the bad men away. The Welshman told them that somebody else had led him to the bad men, but he would not say who it was. Chapter 9 Tom and Becky Are Lost At church, Mrs. Thatcher talked to Mrs. Harper and found out that Becky had not slept there last night. Where was she? Then Aunt Polly said Tom had not come home either. They asked if anybody had seen them on the boat. Nobody could remember. They must still be in the caves, said somebody. A large group of men went to the caves to search for the two children. They searched all day. They searched for three days, but they did not find Tom or Becky. Where could they be? At the picnic, Tom and Becky went into the caves with the other children. They took their candles and walked down a small tunnel. Then Tom saw a small opening he had never seen before. He decided to explore. Becky came with him. They made some marks on the wall. 
This would help them find their way back. They found a large cave with a spring in it. There were a lot of bats hanging on the roof. The bats did not like the candlelight and attacked the children. Tom and Becky ran. They did not watch where they were going. They escaped from the bats and found a lake. They sat down to rest. We haven't heard the other children for a long time, said Becky. We'd better go back, suggested Tom. They tried to find a way back without going through the cave with bats. They were soon lost. They didn't know how to get back. They began to shout. Nobody answered. Becky began to cry. Tom, Tom, we're lost. We can never get out. We should not have left the others. Tom tried to make her feel better. They walked around for a while. Then they found a spring and stayed there. Tom had some cake from the picnic in his pocket, and he gave it to Becky to eat. He ate a small piece himself. They shouted again and sat down to wait. They fell asleep. They woke up. They drank water. They fell asleep again. They woke up again. They did not know how long they had been there. Then they heard somebody shouting, It was far away. They shouted back and tried to get closer, but there was a big hole in the ground that was very deep, and they could not get past it. The shouting went further away until it was gone. They went back to the spring. They were very sad. Tom then tied a piece of string to a rock and walked along one of the other tunnels. Suddenly, he saw a candle burning near him. He shouted. Then he saw that the candle was being carried by Injun Joe. Injun Joe was so frightened by Tom's shout that he ran away. Tom went back to the spring. They slept and woke again. They were very hungry. Tom was afraid of Injun Joe, but he decided to try another tunnel. He saw a light. It was daylight coming through a hole in the roof. He climbed up to it. He got through it and was out. He went back to get Becky, and soon they were both out. They were five miles away from the picnic ground. They had been in the cave for three days. Tom saw a boat on the river and asked the people in it to take them to St. Petersburg. The people in the town were very happy to see the lost children. Both of them were very weak and had to stay in bed for a few days to get strong again. Huckleberry told Tom about following Injun Joe and the stranger into the forest. He wanted revenge on Widow Douglas. Tom was pleased because he had been afraid that Injun Joe wanted revenge on him. Then Huckleberry told him the stranger drowned in the river. Nobody knew him, and nobody knew how he had drowned. Tom told Huckleberry that he had seen Injun Joe in the caves. They decided they would never go there again. Judge Thatcher visited Tom and told him nobody would ever get lost in the caves again. I built a strong wooden wall across it with a door in it. I have the only keys. Nobody will ever go in there again unless they ask me first. Tom's face turned white. What's the matter? asked the judge. Do you need some water? Injun Joe was in the cave, cried Tom. He won't be able to get out. Some men went to the cave to get Injun Joe, but they were too late. When they opened the new door, they saw Injun Joe lying on the ground. He was dead. He was buried near the mouth of the caves, and many people came to the funeral. Chapter 10 Tom is Rich The morning after the funeral, Tom took Huckleberry to a quiet place. Huckleberry was sad because now they would never find the box of money. However, Tom told him that he knew where it was. It was never in room number two. It's in the caves. Say it again, Tom. Say it again. It's in the caves. Will you help me get it out? I will, I will, but I don't want to get lost in there. We won't get lost because I know an easy way to get in there. I'm the only one who knows it, Huck. They got some bread and meat, some string, some bags, and some candles. They borrowed a boat from somebody who wasn't around. Then they went down the river to the hole where Tom and Becky had gotten out of the caves. The hole was covered in bushes, but Tom remembered exactly where it was. It's a great hiding place, said Huckleberry. We'll come and hide things here when we become robbers, said Tom. They went into the caves. Tom was soon back at the spring where he had stayed with Becky. Then he and Huckleberry went to where he had seen Injun Joe. He held up his candle, and they saw a big cross on the wall. Number two, under the cross, said Tom. That's what he said. Huckleberry was afraid. Tom, let's get out. What if Injun Joe's ghost comes? No, ghosts don't want money. Anyway, Injun Joe died five miles from here. It's too far. Huckleberry agreed. 
They got to the cross and began to look under it. It didn't take long for them to find the wooden box with the money. It was very heavy. They couldn't lift it. They took all the money out of the box and put it into the bags. The bags were easier to carry. They got out of the caves and back into the boat. Soon they were back in St. Petersburg. When the Welshman saw them, he made them go to Widow Douglas's house. There were many people there. Widow Douglas gave both boys new clothes to change into. Huckleberry didn't like being with so many people and wanted to leave, but Tom made him stay. The Welshman made a speech and told everybody how Huckleberry had helped to catch Injun Joe. Widow Douglas said she was going to give Huckleberry some money when he was older so that he could start a business. Then Tom said Huck didn't need any money because he already had a lot. He showed everyone the bags with the money. They were amazed. The bags had more than $12,000 in them. Aunt Polly and Widow Douglas put the money in the bank for the boys. The boys were rich. They had over $5 a week to spend. Huckleberry had to wear shoes and go to school. He didn't like it. After a while, he told Tom that he didn't want his money. You take it, he said. I can't live like this. I can't take it, Huck. It's yours. I don't like this life. We were going to be robbers. That sounded like fun, but this is not fun. I'm still going to be a robber. Can I still be one with you? Yes, but robbers are higher up in society than pirates, you know. You have to go to school and wear shoes. You can't be part of my gang if you don't wear good clothes and go to school. Huckleberry agreed to try it for another month. Tom made him promise and write his name in blood. That's better, said Huckleberry. I'm with you. Playlet, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer Scene 1, In the Schoolyard Tom arrives at school. He walks like a very important person. He knows that everybody is watching him, and everybody is envious of him. Two or three smaller boys follow him. Two older boys wave to him and smile. They talk to each other softly, and Tom knows they are talking about him. Becky also arrives at school. Tom pretends that he doesn't see her. He goes up to a group of three boys and three girls and begins to talk to them. Becky hears them talk and moves closer to them so that she can listen. Tom pretends not to notice her. Hey, Tom. What did you eat while you were on the island? Oh, we did all right. Pirates have lots of ways of getting food. We eat better than any of you, I bet. It's easy if you know how. Weren't you afraid of the dark, Tom? It must be terribly dark on the island. Of course not. Have you ever heard of pirates who are afraid of the dark? I guess you would be because there are wild animals on the island, but we weren't. Pirates are much braver than girls. Mary, would you like to come to my picnic? Oh, yes, please. When is it? Oh, soon. What sort of wild animals are on the island, Tom? Well, I'm not sure, but... Gracie, would you like to come to my picnic, too? Oh, yes, thank you. Can I come, too, Becky? And me? And me? Yes, you can all come. She looks at Tom, who is standing next to Amy Lawrence. It's going to be a really good picnic. You know, we heard something that sounded like a lion, and you should have seen the storm. A tree fell over near us and only just missed us. We could have been killed. Tom and Amy begin to walk away from the others. But if you want to be a pirate, you have to face dangers. They walk off stage. Becky watches them leave. She is very angry. Oh, I'll get you, Tom Sawyer! She goes up to Alfred and says very sweetly, Alfred, won't you show me your new picture book? Of course. Alfred and Becky sit down and look at the pictures in Alfred's book with their heads close together. After a few moments, Tom comes in again with Amy and sees them. He is not happy. Amy talks to him, but he is looking at Becky. Becky knows this, but will not look at Tom. She moves even closer to Alfred. You could all have been killed, Tom. Everybody was so worried about you, and they were all very sad to think that you were dead. I was sad, too. And I even cried because you were my special friend. I couldn't bear to think of you gone forever. I'm so happy that... I, uh, I have to do something, Amy. I have to go. He walks away from Amy and leaves the stage. Amy tries to follow him. 
Tom, Tom, wait for me. Becky watches Amy leave. And look at this picture here, Becky. Isn't it wonderful? Becky doesn't look his way. Becky? Go away and leave me alone. I hate you. Alfred stands up and closes his picture book. He looks at Becky. I know. It's that Tom Sawyer, isn't it? Well, I'll teach him. He walks angrily off the stage. Scene two, in the classroom. Alfred walks angrily into the empty classroom. He sees a book on Tom's desk. He picks it up. I'll teach you, Tom Sawyer. He tears a page in the book. He turns to go out, but comes back again and tears another page. Then he leaves. As he goes out, Becky comes in. The torn book is lying on the desk. She goes to look at it. She picks it up, then looks at the door where Alfred has just gone out. The teacher's desk has a very large book on it. Becky sees it and looks around to make sure that nobody sees her. Then she picks it up and opens it. Tom comes into the room. She is surprised and drops the book, tearing one of the pages. Tom, don't sneak up on people. You frighten me. You shouldn't be looking at Mr. Dobbins's book. Now you'll tell Mr. Dobbins that I tore his book. I'll be punished. What will I do? I've never been punished before. It's all your fault. The other children come into the classroom and sit at their desks. The boys are on one side of the room, and the girls are on the other side. Last of all, Mr. Dobbins comes in. Take out your spelling books, children. All the children open their spelling books. Tom sees that his book is torn. He is a little bit surprised, but shrugs his shoulders. Mr. Dobbins sees him. Tom Sawyer, what is wrong with your book? It's torn, sir. Who tore it? I don't know, sir. Well, I do. Come to the front of the class. Tom goes to the front of the class, holding out his hand, ready to be hit. Mr. Dobbins hits it three times. Now go back to your seat and look after your book properly. The children begin to work in their books. Mr. Dobbins goes to his desk and finds his own book torn. He shouts, "Who tore this book?" Nobody speaks. Mr. Dobbins is angry. He looks at the children one by one. Everyone is very quiet. Benjamin Rogers, did you tear this book? No, sir. Joseph Harper, did you? No, sir. Amy Lawrence. No, sir. Mr. Dobbins looks at Becky. Tom looks at her too. They can both see that Becky is very upset and frightened. I did it, sir. You had better come to the front of the class again. This time you will get ten hits instead of three. Tom goes to the front of the class with his hand out. Mr. Dobbins punishes Tom and dismisses the class. As Tom walks out of the classroom, Becky catches up with him. Tom, thank you very much for what you did. I was very scared of getting punished. It was nothing, Becky. You're wrong. It was something special. It was very noble of you, Tom. Tom and Becky smile at each other. Then they walk off the stage together.